The 2023 Louisiana Legends Gala is brought to you by our presenting sponsor, the Gail and Tom Benson Charitable Foundation. Our premier sponsor, the William J. Doré family, with additional support provided in part by the Irene W. and C.B. Pennington Foundation, Louisiana Lottery, and Roy O. Martin, with the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting, and viewers like you. Since 1990, LPB has honored the luminaries who have made Louisiana great. Welcome to the 2023 Louisiana Legends Gala. Your hosts this evening are John Dennison and Robin Merrick. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to Louisiana's magnificent old state capital for the 2023 Louisiana Legends Gala. Now this year, we're delighted that you're joining us for the live gala broadcast. It's lovely to gather to officially celebrate a new group of inductees who have made exceptional contributions to our state. And tonight, we want to honor those achievements. Before we recognize these outstanding women and men, let me introduce my co-host for the evening, Southern University System Vice President for External Affairs and a true friend of LPB, Robin Merrick. Thank you, John. Thank you. The Louisiana Legends Gala was created in 1990 in honor the accomplishments of our state's best and brightest, Louisiana's own sons and daughters who have distinguished themselves in a variety of disciplines from sports, philanthropy, journalism, science, and military service. They join a prestigious list of 156 past Louisiana legends that includes Academy and Grammy Award winners, world-renowned chefs, Nobel Prize winners, and esteemed dignitaries, including the current United States Ambassador to the United Nations. And tonight marks 33 years of celebrating Louisiana legends. This evening, we are recognizing five new honorees. First, we'd like to express our appreciation to Secretary of State Kyle Ardoin and his staff for allowing us to broadcast from Louisiana's old state capital. It is always a privilege for us to present the gala and welcome our Louisiana Legends honorees and guests to this magnificent historical landmark and museum. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to introduce the 2023 Louisiana Legend. Former NFL running back, Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year, and part owner of the Atlanta Falcons, Warwick Dunn. From his start at the Natchitoches Times to his Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of 9-11, decorated journalist Gary Fields. A family whose mission is to create a healthy and prosperous Louisiana. The Irene W. and C.B. Pennington family Presented this evening by Paula Pennington de La Breton. <laughs> Distinguished military officer with almost three decades of service to our country, Brigadier General Gary Mike Jones. One of our honorees could not be with us for tonight's live broadcast, successful businesswoman and philanthropist, Gail Benson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your 2023 Louisiana legend.
And now let's give them the LPB treatment and look at the lives behind these men and women tonight. First, star athlete whose adversities in life led him to greatness, both off the field as well as on the field. We're talking about Warwick Dunn. It's been a blessing to all his brothers and sisters, a blessing to me and all the ones that have come in contact with him. Regardless of what any individual, the world, um, gave him or said, he has always been that person that's going to try to find success. He's not going to do it the way that everybody thinks he should do it, but he's going to do it his way. He's industrious. He's not afraid. He's true to his southern roots. He's gentlemanly. He's respectful. And I think he's never forgotten where he came from. Born on January 5, 1975 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Warwick Dunn grew up the oldest of six. His mother, Betty Smothers, was a Baton Rouge police officer. He moved many times as a child. Um, his mother was a single parent trying to raise kids, and so they would go from sometimes eviction to just needing to leave because the rent had risen. So for Warwick, he grew up really fast. He had to help mom out with raising us. So he was not only big brother, but sometimes filling that father figure role as well. Warwick excelled early on in sports, playing quarterback, cornerback, and running back. His sophomore year at Catholic High School, Warwick helped lead his team to the state 4A championship for the first time in its history. But during Warwick's senior year of high school, tragedy struck. Two days before his 18th birthday, his mother was killed while working an off-duty security job. January 7th in 1993 changed our whole life. And, um, not knowing if we was going to stay together, if we was going to be separated. Warwick was determined to keep us together, and, and, it, and it happened. We stayed together, and you couldn't ask that from another 18-year-old. Anytime we needed him, he was always there, regardless of what college class he had or what event he has. He has stepped up and gave us that father figure, that missing piece that we didn't have uh, when we lost our mom. He took care of us before his own needs. He's extraordinary, not just in the way he's overcome loss, but extraordinary in the way he helped raise his siblings, extraordinary in the way that he continued his life. Despite the devastating loss of his mother, Warwick carried on to Florida State University, where he became a football track and field star. His first year on the football team, they won a national championship. He was a three-time All-ACC selection and rushed for over 1,000 yards in three straight football seasons. Warwick graduated in 1997 with a degree in information studies. He is actually the first person in our family to receive a college degree, which opened the doors for the other siblings of us to see what it looks like um, to achieve higher education with young high school. When he got to college um, at Florida State and they asked him, um, are you going to enter the draft? He said, I've been broke for 22 years. Another year's not going to hurt. And he not only did that for himself, but he did that for us so we can see what success looked like. In 1997, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers selected Warwick in the first round of the NFL draft. Out of the gates, Warwick achieved tremendous success. He was selected to the NFC Pro Bowl team and named Offensive Rookie of the Year by the Associated Press. I remember this like it was yesterday. Um, the career has never been easy. Uh, everybody doubted that he would even make <laughs> the NFL because of his size. And he always had to prove himself day in and day out, no matter what um, position he played or what team he played for. He always had to prove himself. In 2002, Warwick joined the Atlanta Falcons, making nine touchdowns in his first year and leading the team with a 5.4 yards per carry average. 
Then we had a successful career at Atlanta Falcons where he was actually nominated and won the Man of the Year, the highest award you can get as an NFL player. After a brief reunion with the Buccaneers, Warwick retired from the NFL in 2009 and became a minority owner of the Atlanta Falcons. Warwick's greatest achievements, however, have come off the field. Early on in his career, he founded Homes for the Holidays, a program that helps single parents secure fully furnished homes. There's a lot of talk about Warwick giving homes away, and he always says that it's so disrespectful to allow that notion to continue because it's not true. The parents have worked, they've attended classes, they've saved a certain amount of money for their down payment. They have cleared up any kind of debt issues. They go about, you know, meeting all the metrics that they need to meet to, uh, to be able to buy into the home. His foundation works to break generational poverty. And we know that it's going to affect the mother's life, but he is also interested in the way that it affects the children's lives too. More than 210 families have been helped through Warwick's foundation, the ultimate tribute to Warwick's mother. I think the magic of Warwick's program, uh, Homes for the Holidays, is that it's genuine because it's connected to his experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Warwick Dunn. Congratulations, Warwick. Thank you. I really just want to say thank you. I'm getting a little emotional from watching, uh, watching the video, but LPB, thank you guys um, for this. Um, you know, my journey, obviously, it started Really, that journey started when I was a lot younger, and, and being the oldest of six, uh, I'm, I'm just thankful that my mom instilled a lot of values in me to care about my brothers and sisters and just care about family. And I just think over the years, you know, from my experience, I had a lot of individuals that have come into my life that were like God in lights, and they were God sent. And I know my pops, uh, Malin Brooks, who, who was my little league coach. From 10 years old, he's, he's like my father figure. And he really honed in and helped me be a better big brother to my younger brothers and sisters. And then as I got older, you know, I have my coaches here from, from Catholic High School, and those guys played a huge part in my, my growth and my development. And I mean, I just thank you guys for um, all that you have done. And to really just move forward, this city, when I lost my mom, you know, taught me that they cared about their community. They care about each other. And I, I say this all the time, that Baton Rouge taught me what it means to care about your neighbor. When we lost my mom, you guys started a fund for us, and that's how we were able to survive over the first few years. And, you know, we still had to do the work to, to move forward, but it was... This, you know, Baton Rouge, right? People in Louisiana that really stepped up and cared about us and our well-being. And I'm just so thankful for that. And I know my grandmother is uh, here tonight. Um, I always call her my favorite girl in the world. And um, she's 85 years old. And, you know, that's who we, we live through. <laughs> Let me just tell you, she doesn't do that often, okay? <laughs> she doesn't do that often. But, um, you know, I'm just so thankful that you guys care about individuals, care about community, and what we're doing at the charity is, you know, my mom's experience and just reliving my mom's dream through other single parents. And if we can continue to grow and impact communities in a positive way, that's what it's about. And, you know, my family, brothers and sisters, I mean, I love you guys, and just thank you, Louisiana. Appreciate it.
Accomplished business professional and philanthropist with strong ties to her community and the passion for helping others. Ladies and gentlemen, we present Gail Benson. I think that the most outstanding character of Gail is that she lives her faith and she is a woman of great faith and she is a person who integrates her faith in all of her personal life as well as in her business life. She's just a unbelievably kind, gentle, uh, heart of gold, uh, cares about other people, puts other people first. At the same time, she is, uh, she's very hardworking. Um, she, um, she's uh, always trying to improve always talking about how we can get better. She cares deeply about Louisiana, she cares about the region, and she cares about other people, and I think that's what really drives her. Gail Marie Lejani was born on January 26, 1947 in New Orleans. She grew up in old Algiers in a devout Catholic family. Gail attended St. Joseph, St. Anthony, and Holy Name of Mary schools, and graduated from Martin Berman High School in 1966. In 1968, Gail began managing a prestigious New York-based costume jeweler, one of her first chapters in what would become an extraordinary and diverse professional career. She soon branched out into real estate development, integrating her passion for interior design with property management. She would go on to reach tremendous heights in her design career for 30 years. In 2000, Gail helped lead renovations to the iconic New Orleans Superdome's landmark third and fourth level public spaces, in addition to renovations on select suites. In 2004, she met the love of her life, Tom Benson, at Mass in St. Louis Cathedral of New Orleans. The marriage was a very loving marriage. She was able to help Tom a great deal, I think, to put focus to his life because he had so many responsibilities and was scattered in so many ways. And I think Gio helped him to redirect his life, uh, to have focus. And also she helped him to uh, look at the needs of others and to be generous. Part of that focus was with the New Orleans Saints and Pelicans. With Gail at the helm alongside Tom, the Saints reached new heights, featuring 10 winning seasons, nine playoff berths, seven division titles, three NFC championship appearances, and the Super Bowl 44 title. Out of the gates, Tom and Gail proved to be a dynamic partnership oriented by their faith. I think in terms of success, she not only is very talented and, and very intelligent, but she also works with a team of people and she values teamwork, she values collaboration, and she listens to people, and then she makes decisions based on what she believes is right and what she believes is according to God's will. As a longtime member of the New Orleans Catholic community, Gail has worked for years with the Archdiocese of New Orleans to deliver health and human services to Louisianans struggling across eight Southeast Louisiana parishes, as well as eradicate food insecurity throughout the state. She has a great sense of generosity. Whenever she sees an event or a project that is worthwhile, she does what she can. And she gets many, many, many requests many of which she cannot fulfill. She um, has been the chair for 10 years of Moonlight Miracles. We raised about $2 million a year. And recently we just completed um, doubling the size of our cancer center thanks to her gifts. And I, I think she's legendary just because she is just an amazing person. Um, you know, obviously she, she takes the fact that she has these amazing resources, but she thinks about it as a responsibility to help the community, to help the state and to help others. I think what guides her in her philosophy really in, in everything, whether it's her personal relationships or, or co company relationships or community relationships really stems from her, from her faith. Um, she takes her faith, um, you know, it's very important for her. She feels very strongly in her faith. Every Sunday she lectures at the cathedral and for any special events as well. And she considers that a privilege to be able to proclaim the Word of God and to do that for the congregation 
and she does it with great passion and with great love. Tom Benson passed away on March 15, 2018, but Gail has kept his legacy alive through the Saints and the Pelicans and her commitment to charity. Along with Mr. Benson and, and Mrs. Benson carrying on their tradition, um, both of them have been extraordinarily um, impactful for our community. Um, in, in the obvious ways we see with the Saints and the Pelicans and the literally hundreds of millions of dollars that um, go back to the community, go into various charities. Um, that's, what, that's what people see and read about. But I think the thing that's most special is the relationships that she builds in the community with folks that you may not see on the front page, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, her walking into, um, you know, uh, a store and knowing that there's around Christmas time and there's a lot of bills to pay and she pays off everyone's um, bills that, that are on layaway. I mean, that's informs a relationship that way. Um, you know, walking into a home for children and, and coming in and saying, Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and takes them all to Disney World. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that people don't see, kind of random acts of kindness that we talk about. She lives that every single day, and um, it's pretty special to be a part of and, and to witness and see. While Mrs. Benson couldn't join us this evening, she did provide us with an acceptance speech, so I would ask that you view the screen. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this special honor. And please accept my sincere apologies for not being available to be with you all this evening. The first round of the NFL draft, as you know, is taking place tonight. And I am really excited to return back to the Saints headquarters to be with our staff. I am truly humbled to accept the 2023 Louisiana Legends Award and would like to extend my thanks to all of you, and especially friends of the Louisiana Public Broadcasting, for such a humbling recognition. To be recognized as a legend of our state alongside Warwick Dunn, Gary Fields, Gary Jones, and the Pennington family is a tremendous honor for me. I would like to offer my congratulations and thanks to all of the honorees for what they have accomplished on behalf of our great state of Louisiana. I have always been proud to call Louisiana my home and make it a point to promote our unique culture whenever I travel. As a state, we truly have much to be proud of and an abundance of potential for a very bright future. While the New Orleans Saints and Pelicans are the businesses that get the most headlines, one of the areas within our organization that I am most excited about is our Benson Capital Partners Venture Fund. The people we have had the opportunity to work with and help grow their businesses are truly inspiring to me and leave me more optimistic than ever about the future of Louisiana. We are blessed to have many creative and talented entrepreneurs in this state, and many of them do not have access to funding, and we help provide them for this funding. Our team of investors are working hard to change that and attract the level of funding necessary to allow these businesses to flourish, create jobs, and build a stronger future for Louisiana. Over the years, we have seen what we can accomplish as a community when we come together in common purpose. I often encourage people to focus on the many things that unite us rather than the few things that divide us. Louisiana is such a special place, and we are at our best when we are uniting people. Look no further than the other list of honorees tonight. They have a history of bringing people together. 
Thank you again to my fellow honorees for what you have all accomplished and continue to do while making Louisiana its best. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the evening, and I promise we will do our best during the draft to make you proud of our team. May you all enjoy and have a very special evening. Thank you. Thurgood Marshall Award recipient and recognized as Journalist of the Year by the Association of Black Journalists. Ladies and gentlemen, let's learn a little more now about Gary Fields. You know, if you know Gary, you love Gary because he's a salt of the earth kind of guy. He's a devoted father and husband and he cares about people and um, he's a great writer, but more than that, he's a great person. He's the most genuine, compassionate person I have ever met. Like, he will give even if he does not have it to give. He will still give it. Gary was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1960. His father's career with the Air Force took the family to Japan and Germany before landing them in Alexandria, Louisiana. Gary attended 12 schools in 12 years, including Peabody High School and Bolton High School in Alexandria, where he graduated in 1978. He then went to Southern University in Baton Rouge before transferring to LSU Alexandria, where he was selected as the top English student on campus. Gary graduated with a bachelor's degree in journalism in 1982. Then he went to work on a master's degree in English from Northwestern State in Natchitoches. He quietly did little things uh, at Northwestern that were really, really big things. The Blue Key National Honor Fraternity, Student Union Governing Board. Uh, he was an RA at Bonado Hall, one of the oldest dorms at Northwestern. He was in uh, Sigma Delta Chi, worked at KNWD, the campus radio station, and uh, did a whole lot of other things at a time when there were very few minorities on campus. In 1985, Gary joined the Shreveport Times, where he led coverage of six parishes. He reported on a variety of issues, including school boards, city councils, and military news. He also covered night cops and the growing problems of crack cocaine and gang wars. In 1990, Gary went national, moving to Washington, D.C. to work for USA Today. He eventually moved to the Washington Times, where he was a police reporter during the city's record high homicide rates. He returned to USA Today for 10 years before joining the Wall Street Journal in 2000. He covered quite a few topics, including mental health, the prison system, the justice system, and um, the Alabama church burnings. There's a theme all throughout his career, all throughout his life, where he writes about uh, people other people really don't notice. He spent the full year in Native American lands around the U.S chronically in the legal lives of America's first citizens, pointing out that constitutional rights that we enjoy were not applicable there. He's looked at over-criminalization of our society and how that impacts people's everyday lives as they try to work, get licenses, provide for their families. He goes inside prisons and talks to people there, not in a judgmental way, but to learn who they are, who their families are, who their victims are, why they're there. And each step he tries to turn the light on people who make up the vast majority of society but who don't get the microphone or the megaphone. As a reporter, he was the voice for people that could not speak up, like, no matter what. Like, he was just, he was the voice that everybody needed him to be. He's seen a lot through his reporting on the mental health system and the prison system. And I know that um, that can be hard. He's had to write about some really terrible things. And um, it's not made him cynical or hardened his heart in any way. And I think it's, um, as a matter of fact, opened him up even more 
especially to the most vulnerable among us. In 2002, Gary was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for the Wall Street Journal's breaking news coverage of the World Trade Center attack. Gary doesn't like to talk about it, but you know, he is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. And from a guy who uh, went to the same university that he did and, you know, is in the same fraternity as he did, I'm super proud uh, to know a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and he just happens to be my friend. He carries no ego, so he's always shocked when he's recognized or getting awards and I'm never surprised by it. His faith also has been a huge part of who he is, but he would tell you a question he asks is, what would Jesus do and what would Jesus say about what I am doing? Gary's faith guided his next career move. After 17 years, he left the Wall Street Journal and began working in agricultural development across Africa with Lutheran World Relief. His experiences producing stories around the refugee crisis in South Sudan and northern Uganda had a tremendous impact on his worldview and continues to shape his life. He has been a foster parent, a church council president, a tutor, a volunteer for various causes, and a supporter of international causes as well. He would tell you he doesn't want to be remembered as a journalist, just a man who got up and gave it what he had every day knowing there were days when he slipped, but he got up again the next day. Gary is married to Helen, whom he met on a blind date in Washington, D.C. They have three beautiful daughters, Rachel, China, and Brianna, and three grandchildren. He is just overall a wonderful person. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Fields. Well, first off, thank you, LPB, for, for this honor. I almost feel like I don't need to say anything after looking at that. You guys have pretty much covered it. It is an understatement of biblical proportions to say that I am honored, humbled, and frankly, despite that, still puzzled to be here. It would be like calling Exodus a neighborhood block party. <laughs> I've looked at the accomplishments and the achievements and the contributions of legends that came before us and the extraordinary people I'm here with tonight, myself excluded. And I've been asking, what are you doing here? What are you guys thinking? I said, well, maybe you need somebody named Gary. Well, you got Gary Jones right here. <laughs> well, maybe you need somebody from Alexandria or, or even from my high school. Well, the Martins, who are a major sponsor of LPB, all went to Bolton, including Roy, who graduated in the same class I did. So that's not it. So the only thing I could come up with is, I've got Louisiana in my soul. And when I say that, I don't just mean the state of Louisiana. Louisiana is more than a state. It's a state of mind. It's a character and its people that requires of us, demands of us, asks of us that we use our treasures, we use our talents, we use everything that we have to help other people do whatever you can for who you can, whatever way you can. Whether it is out on the football field, whether it is making contributions to society, or whether it's just an ink-stained ink wretch like myself, you help who you can, when you can, whatever way you can. It's the Louisiana state of mind. It is the young man who endured unimaginable tragedy and loss, but has combined that 
with sublime athletic talent to help hundreds if not thousands of families. It is the family that has supported so many causes, but especially medical research to save lives and give people hope. It is the general who has actually gone out and saved lives by training our young people and giving to them the same values that he has of duty, honor, courage, commitment. Often while serving in places that he can't actually talk about, and I couldn't pronounce them if he did. <laughs> it is the businesswoman who owns athletic franchises, but her greatest contribution to Louisiana isn't as the owner of the New Orleans Saints, it's as the patron saint of every other cause from here to Timbuktu. And yeah, in a small way, it is the great grandson of sharecroppers off by Rapids in Alexandria, Louisiana, who has tried to actually carry that Louisiana state of mind with him. It has been passed down to him from all of these folks are dead now, but his grandmother Viney and his grandfather Sam, his mom Shirley, his dad Bill, all of his cousins, his aunts and uncles, the Sanders, the Gills, the Phils, the Mounts, the Nelsons, who all live by this simple creed if you have two slices of bread and you meet a man with none, you give him one and you make a fold over sandwich and everybody eats. You do what you can, when you can, whatever way you can. My career and my personal life, I have tried to do that. I've missed sometimes, but I have tried to do that. Sometimes by going to tell stories and look at people that everybody else walks past and to say, I see you and I hear you and I'm going to write about you because you're in my heart and because all of you are out here walking this path that we call life and doing the best you can, but not everybody has the same thing. That has sent me during Katrina, for instance, not just to New Orleans, but to come down to Washington Parish where some of the best first responders in the state were the inmates at the prison. They were out clearing roads and helping to move down power lines and handing out water and food and those kind of things because they had a purpose. And they wanted to show just because you've made a mistake once doesn't mean you are forever mistake prone. Excuse me, that's who I actually go after and that's who I'm going to forever go after. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm never going to think that I actually belong here with this group and with the folks that have gone on before me. But I am going to say I accept this on behalf of everybody who has that Louisiana state of mind. And that means my teachers like Melba Malvo in St. Martinville, Mr. Hunt in St. Martinville, Lewis Roberts at Bolton, Penny Tony, my college professors, even family members and friends who have helped me out in my life like Martha and Lyman, all these people who had little but looked and said somebody has less. So help them. It's the Louisiana state of mind. Thank you. It all started with a couple's vow to share their success from a remarkable discovery, and the family continues the spirit of generosity, making a global impact to health and wellness. Ladies and gentlemen, the Irene W. and C.B. Pennington family. Well, the Pennington family have made an enormous contribution uh, to uh, the city of Baton Rouge and to the state of Louisiana. They love Louisiana. Everything Louisiana stands for is the Pennington Foundation. The story of the Pennington family begins with Claude B. Doc Pennington and his wife, Irene Wells Pennington, both Louisiana natives. Doc started as a doctor um, and then got into the oil business and was fortunate enough to do very well, but also was somewhat of a Renaissance man and a very humble man. 
and that would describe the entire family. Once he did very well, he wanted to share it with the entire community and believe that from the bottom of his heart. That altruism has been spread down throughout his grandchildren. In 1980, Doc and Irene generously donated $125 million to support the construction of a health sciences research center in Baton Rouge. But it was after he was diagnosed with cancer and started to change his nutrition habits, he realized that that could help cure cancer and that with science, we could learn more about that and it could help us understand about curing many diseases. Doc Pennington's gift of 125 million in 1983, which would probably translate to three or four hundred million dollars today, uh, was hugely significant in establishing Pennington, uh, building the institution, uh, bringing in scientists from all over the world and from Louisiana uh, to work on nutrition-related problems and metabolic problems. Dr. John Kerwin is just one of the many scientists drawn by the center's stellar reputation. I got a call one day in Cleveland, Ohio, at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, inviting me to uh, interview for a position as director of the institution. I was both surprised and excited. It was a tremendous opportunity, uh, which comes by once in a lifetime. So Pennington nationally is known as The Pennington. Um, it is famous for its research in chronic diseases. Most of the um, major discoveries around uh, lifestyle interventions, diet, exercise, behavioral modifications, many of the medications that are used to treat chronic diseases like obesity and type 2 diabetes have been trialed and developed at Pennington. As an institution and its scientists um, are world renowned in terms of the work that goes on here. In 1982, Doc started the Irene W. and C.B. Pennington Foundation, which would eventually grow to include Doc and Irene's grandchildren's visions and passions for philanthropy. Claude Pennington focuses on public safety, disaster relief, human services, and sports and recreation. Daryl has dedicated support to rural, hard-to-reach communities and youth programs surrounding addiction, education, and recreation. He also focuses on environmental issues and public safety. Paula's interests include arts and science and human service programs that provide access and inclusivity with a special focus on children. To describe the Pennington family in one word would be generous. They give with their heart. I'm very fortunate to know them as a family and to see that side of them where they are very just real. They're very real people. The Pennington Foundation reaches far and wide, committed to improving the quality of life for people and children across Louisiana. I started working with the Pennington Foundation about 20 years ago, and uh, together we worked with women in poverty. Uh, these women were primarily homeless. Uh, Fifteen years later, today, uh, the nonprofit operates 15 group homes and we house 30 women and these women are suffering from substance abuse and today those ladies um, they've gone from basically poverty to uh, financial security. The Pennington family of Louisiana has made significant contributions to the state's history and culture. Whether through their work in science, business, or the arts, the Penningtons have left an indelible mark on Louisiana and continue to shape the state's future. We have all benefited in attending a concert, heard a nutritional discussion, or hold hope that chronic diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes might one day be eliminated because of the generosity of the Pennington family.
Ladies and gentlemen, accepting the award for the family is Paula Pennington de la Breton. Good evening. On behalf of the Pennington family, I would like to thank the friends of LPB for the recognition of the philanthropic vision of my grandparents, Irene W. and Claude B. Doc Pennington, Mama and Papa, to my brothers Claude, Daryl, and me. I would also like to congratulate our fellow esteemed honorees. Papa was born in Chunky, Mississippi and moved to Baton Rouge in the early 1900s. Mama was born in Bayou Serra, Louisiana. They first met on Third Street and married in 1921. Their only child, our father, Claude B. Pennington, Jr., died in an oil field accident when we were young, and our grandparents became even more involved in our lives. Papa practiced optometry until his father's death in 1926, and then returned to his passion the oil fields, a decision that ultimately made my grandparents' philanthropy possible. I remember when we were youngsters sitting around the breakfast table at my grandparents' home. He would ask us, what would you do to help people? Papa was fascinated with nutrition and vitamins and disease prevention and treatment. He had the foresight to say, we have to get doctors to learn how to keep us well, and not just get us well after we get sick. Your body is no better than the vitamins you put in it. Puffing on his cigar, he added, I shouldn't smoke, but I do. I have to have some vices. In 1980, my grandparents donated $125 million to LSU, the largest private individual donation to a public university at that time. Papa believed nutrition is the thing. What we eat makes up our bodies, but also helps determine our mental condition. He refer referred to the Pennington theory, the brain starts development from the first sound. The body starts development from the first nutrition. Forty years ago, the ground was broken on the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. Paul Paul wrote, this should be the biggest and best nutrition research center in the country. His vision has changed the lives of people in our state, throughout the nation, and across the globe. The center works to eliminate chronic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, cancer, and cardiovascular diseases. One of the most impressive accomplishments is its ongoing partnership with the U.S. Department of Defense, designing optimal nutrition for soldiers and their families based on research in health, readiness, and performance. The center is recognized for its role in creating the DASH diet, ranked by the U.S. News and World Report as the number one best diabetes diet and the best heart healthy diet. The center is at the forefront in the development of all approved obesity medications and key medicines for diabetes. They also continue their work to remove the stigma of obesity. We must stop the blame game. We are extremely proud to be part of the center's past, present, and future. Our Family Foundation was created in 1982 to improve the quality of life for families and children throughout Louisiana. Our support began with 25 nonprofit organizations and has grown to over 100 annually under the guidance of the entire staff at the Foundation. We incorporated our grandparents' vision by continuing their legacy and our philanthropic giving. A large part of our contributions is in the greater Baton Rouge area and surrounding parishes, including East and West Feliciana and Point Capi. We focus on social, 
and emotional learning, health and chronic diseases, the arts, public safety, economic development, disaster and community resilience, sports and recreation, environment and accessibility and inclusion for all. Community partners include the Pennington Cancer Center at the Baton Rouge General Hospital, the Emerge Center, the Knock Knock Children's Museum, the Claude B. Junior, Claude B. Pennington Jr. YMCA, and the Louisiana Arts and Science Museum, Irene W. Pennington Planetarium, which was the first public building named in the state of Louisiana for a living person. The Planetarium and the Irene W. and C.V. Pennington Foundation Great Performers in Concert Series are both celebrating 20-year anniversaries this year. My personal love of science and the arts came to fruition last year when Renee Fleming, world-renowned soprano and humanitarian, collaborated with the Center's scientists in presenting the impact of music and arts on human health and the brain. Claude is involved with the Children's Advocacy Center, Companion, Companion Animal Alliance, TAF, LSU Recovery and Rehabilitation Suite for Athletes, and supports critical disaster relief programs along with equipment for first responders. Darrell's focus is on remote rural communities in Louisiana and Mississippi to improve municipal services. He advocates for children's programs, including the Avondale Boy Scouts Writing Program and the Feliciana 4-H. Other organizations include the Louisiana Wildlife Federation, Heritage Ranch, and Mission Heart. God blessed our parents, our grandparents, and they in turn blessed our community with health and wellness. My brothers and I know the importance of a family's personal commitment to the greater good, and our grandparents definitely inspired that within us. We will continue to keep their legacy alive. Thank you. A retired commander of the United States Army Special Forces Airborne Command with worldwide responsibility for fighting the global war on terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Gary M. Jones. He loved Louisiana so much. Gary's a Louisiana legend because from humble beginnings, he, he answered his nation's call. General Jones's life is an example of uh, the triumph of the human spirit. He loved all his friends and their families, his teachers, his coaches. He was an impeccable leader. Uh, men and women would follow him anywhere. On October 12, 1954, Gary Mike Jones was born in Shreveport, Louisiana, the oldest of six children. From an early age, Mike developed a reputation for his charisma and ability to lead. I met General Jones in 1967 at Broadmoor Junior High. We became uh, teammates, and in a matter of three or four days of uh, knocking heads with everybody, I figured out that he was a force of nature. He was a great athlete, uh, filled with enthusiasm, and within a few days we knew he was the leader. But I like to say that our high school team was his first uh, platoon. He literally would look at us with that grin and say, uh, let's roll, boys. He talks so much about his friends and their families and his coaches, his teachers. Um, that put so much into his life when he was younger. 
He went to LSU on a full scholarship the same year that freshmen could play varsity football. And of course, General Jones made the varsity team. He also double tracked and became involved in LSU's prominent ROTC program. And while he is literally practicing football every day, when he's through with that, he's going to ROTC uh, training and he ultimately became the commandant of the LSU ROTC and was named number one in his class. On the day he graduated from LSU, General Jones was commissioned into the Army. He headed to his first posting at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, where he trained as a CI agent. He then attended Airborne School at Fort Benning and was assigned to the 3rd Infantry Division in Germany, where he served as a CI agent, infantry platoon leader, and infantry company commander until 1981. He would go on to command all levels of the Green Beret in the United States. The current Green Berets are the most elite army in the history of mankind, and he was the commander of it. I hold him in the highest regard for all that because it was a culmination of a lifetime of leadership, pursuit of excellence, uh, work ethic, perseverance, humility, and love. He literally was involved in every conflict that the United States was involved with from the mid-1990s from the mid through the 2000s. He participated in the invasion of Panama. His unit captured General Noriega's pilot, which was a significant uh, intelligence windfall. By the time he got to Bosnia and Kosovo, he commanded the Joint Special Operations Task Force. And significantly, he was responsible for the capture of 25 individuals who had committed crimes against humanity, indicted as, against, as war criminals, and ensured that they were delivered to the, tri to the Hague for trial. When he first went in Special Forces, that was his dream. Um, if he could have the ultimate job, it would be Special Forces Commander. Perhaps General Jones's greatest command was with Operation Enduring Freedom, just weeks after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He was assigned as the Deputy Director for Clandestine Military Operations of the CIA's Counterterrorism Center. General Jones was ordered into Afghanistan and spent years there fighting the Taliban. And uh, the details of which no one knows because a lot of what he did was under the auspices of not only the United States Army, but also the CIA. And I have crossed paths with people that know of him or knew him and have told me that they thought that he was the finest American soldier that they had ever met. In 2006, after 28 years of active duty, General Jones retired from the United States Army. He's the consummate leader. He's a consummate professional. He's someone that you want to you want to do your very best for at all times. The most important relationship General Jones formed, however, would be with his wife Helen, who describes him as her hero and best friend. They've been married for over 35 years. It's just been a big Cinderella story for me. He's always been so wonderful to me and a great father to my boys. And I couldn't have been more blessed. Mike and Helen currently reside in North Carolina. They have three children, Dustin, Chansey, and Jacqueline. Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Gary Mike Jones. Boy, how do you follow these people? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'm an old football player, so I'm very emotional. 
Uh, I love this state and I love the people. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for all being here tonight. I'd first like to start by thanking Terry Crockett, the Executive Director of Louisiana Public Broadcasting, and a wonderful staff for the hard work they did to put this together. Second, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Governor uh, John Bell Edwards for having us at his home today. For most of you who don't know, uh, John Bell Edwards is a former military officer. He was a Dean's List graduate from West Point. He served for eight years in the Army. He served in the 25th Infantry Division, the 82nd Airborne Division. He was an infantry company commander. He was an airborne ranger and master parachutist. I don't think you will find in any other state in America a governor that has those qualifications. After leaving the military, Governor Edwards went to law school and ran for the legislature and represented the people of Tangipaho Parish. He did exactly what they asked him to do. He's now spent two terms in Louisiana as our governor, a total of eight years, and for a second time, he has done what the people of Louisiana asked him to do, serve us, serve us faithfully and selflessly, and he has done so. Me, as a fellow officer, understanding what he has done and where he is at in his life, I will salute him and Donna for the selfless service that they have provided to us as the citizens of Louisiana. I think he's a wonderful man. Now, before I go any further, I would like to ask this group and body here, do we have any Gold Star mothers or fathers that are present with us tonight? For those of you who do not know what a Gold Star mother or father is, that is a mother or father whose son or daughter has been killed in combat action or through military training events in the United States. I'm glad to see that we do not. The other thing I would ask is do we have any first responders or any police officers or firefighters who might have died in the course of their duty, and if you are here, please stand. Mark, would you please? This is a legend. This is a hero. His mother gave her life so that we had our futures. She gave up our, our, her future for our future. Or I love you and I will never forget you. Your mother is a hero to me and a legend. God bless you. I'm not a hero or a legend. I was simply a soldier once and young. I believe that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among those rights is the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now those are words that come from our past and carry great value and strength with me. But we still have work ahead in our nation to ensure that the people that we love as our citizens of Louisiana have the same ability to reach what those great words mean for us. There is still work to be done. Very simply put, I took an oath on the 5th of August, 1977. When in the Army, I took an oath. I said, Gary, I, Gary M. Jones, do solemnly swear and affirm to support the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I take this oath and obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of that office and obey the orders of the officers and the President appointed above me. 
Now, I know what real heroes and legends are. I've seen them. They are the sons and daughters of our great nation who have laid their lives on the altar of liberty. They have sacrificed for each and every one of us like Warwick's mom has. And to do so, again, they gave up their futures for our futures. These are our legends. From my classmates and friends at C. E. Bird and Shreveport, we had a class motto. And I think this motto embraces what Louisiana is about. The motto was, God is first, our friends are second, and I am third. Number one and foremost, to me, God is first. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I make no bones about it, and I'm proud of it, and I am not ashamed of it under any condition. I consider him in all things that I do first, and I ensure that he is foremost in my decisions. And in my consult and counsel for what I do, I ask for his guidance. I'm a product, as my wife said, of my teachers, my coaches, first responders, law enforcement officials, and my friends, good graces. These people to me are people like Miss Yvonne Alexander, Miss Peggy Smith, Miss Marie Bowden, coaches like Jimmy Harrison, Coach Rambin, Bill Berry, Crockett, coaches like Charlie McKin McClendon, Coach Randall, McCarthy, Purvis, and one who was a senior mentor to me for four years while I was LSU, a Mr. Sims Regard, who was a former FBI agent and a uh, lobbyist here for 30 years for the oil and gas industry, who helped me make a decision on going into the Army. I spent plenty of hours with Sims talking about leadership, values, honesty, integrity, loyalty, all the things that young men needed to know about. I took a lot of time away from his family, and I want to thank him and his family for allowing me to share their father. The thing that I would say that is strikingly unique for all of this, these were white and black men and women who loved me as their son. They invested everything in me to ensure that I would be a leader or a champion. They ensured that they always told me that I could do anything that I wanted to do. There was never anything that I couldn't do. As it was explained to me, champions are winners, but not all winners are champions. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, a champion needs to ensure that he strives for excellence in everything that he does. He must be prepared to carry out the mission that is at hand, and he must ensure that those who are around him are held to the same standard. You know, one of the things that a champion does or a leader does is what old Tom Landry said a long time ago. He said, our job is making people do things they don't want to do to achieve things they want to achieve. And in my college room, one of the things that I had over my desk was a saying that I believe in greatly. And that is, some people see things as they are and say, why? I see things that never were and say, why not? I learned a lot from my friends and mentors in Louisiana. I learned about loving my fellow man, loving my neighbor, ensuring that we always understood the market requirement for forgiveness at all times. Anyone that transgresses against you, ensure that you forgive them with all your heart. This is the nature of the people of Louisiana. They're all like this. My wonderful friends that are here with me tonight, I have to take a minute to mention them. My good friend Marshall and Cindy Jones that are here with us tonight. But it's, as Hillary Clinton once said, it takes a village. His father, Bubba Jones, treated me as a son. Along with that, Michael, 
and Ann Leonard, who are here with us tonight. Mike's mother treated me like her son. She loved me unconditionally through all my faults. I called her Mama Leonard. Dr. Paul Nader, who's with us here today, good friend of mine who played ball with me from elementary school up through high school, one of my greatest friends. His brother, Dr. Sam Nader, is here tonight with son and daughter, Bo and Holland. I want you to know that Sam gave me my first football jersey in junior high school. Now, I'm an LSU fan and played at LSU, but it was an Auburn jersey. It had number 44 on it. <laughs> and the only thing I knew, it was an LSU jersey, okay? So, Sam, I don't know where you are out there. I really can't see you, but I want you to know I love you with all my heart. The one thing that I would tell you about Sam Nader, if I ever wanted to follow a man to make my life like them, it would be like Dr. Sam Nader. <laughs> Last but not least, I would say one other individual in here I have to mention, a man named Bo Harris. I don't know if you know Bo Harris. Bo Harris played Cincinnati Bengals, but he played at LSU. Bo Harris was the greatest defensive football player I ever saw in my life in Louisiana and is one of the most wonderful men that I know. One of the things I would say is selfless love and forgiveness is a hallmark of Louisiana and everywhere we go. It's the cornerstone of who we are. We're the greatest nation in the world. I have been to every continent that I can name, and there is no country anywhere that is like America. And Louisiana is its greatest state. Its value base that is projected to everyone that comes in contact with us presents competent leaders that are prepared to go out and do the jobs that a lot of people do not want to do. And I can assure you that they will stand up and seize the moment and be real leaders. Kindness is another watchword of Louisiana. And because we are kind and thoughtful, people must understand to not take that as a sign of weakness. Let it be known that there are rough men that stand guard at night, every night, willing to do bad things to people who would do us harm. And let this be a warning that if anyone harms Americans, we will track you down and find you wherever you are in the world and bring you to justice. You can be assured of that. The last thing that I would tell you if they elect to meet us on the field of battle, their sons and daughters will be orphans. I guarantee you that. We're the greatest nation that ever existed in the history of this world. And I will tell you right now that we are prepared to do what is necessary to ensure that this freedom that we hold so dear will never perish from this earth. As for the state of America today, we have a time of discourse. I would ask that you remember these words. These are the words of Abraham Lincoln in his first inaugural address. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may be strained, it must not break the bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and every patriot grave to every living heart and heartstone all over the broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely it will be, by the better angels of our nature. I would ask as we look at discourse in America that we address the better angels of our nature, that we remember 
that love is number one in what we do in this world, and that unmitigated forgiveness must always be considered in everything that we do, and that we must love our neighbors as we love ourselves. The last thing I would leave you with is what Colin Powell told me one time. He was a good friend of mine and one of the finest men I've ever known in my life. Colin Powell said that no soldier ever gave, ever gave up his life abroad to own or hold land. The only thing that an American soldier ever asked for was a piece of ground to bury his dead. Folks, I'll leave you with this. I'm extremely honored and humbled to be from Louisiana. I am proud. As I look at this audience, our diversity, our love, and our care for each other makes us the most powerful force this world has ever seen. I'm humbled to be here. I thank you for this award, and from the bottom of my heart, I ask we God bless Louisiana and God bless this great nation and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for your 2023 Louisiana Legends. Now I'd like to call on Secretary of State Carl Ardwan to come up for a very special presentation. Secretary. Thank you. Well, I don't know how a politician follows all this. Good evening to all of you. Uh, I am the 44th Secretary of State of the State of Louisiana, and this is the most awesome event in the most awesome building in the state of Louisiana because it's under my purview. <laughs> the legends we are here to honor represent incredible accomplishments in the fields of military service, business, sports, journalism, medicine, and philanthropy. While they come from very different backgrounds and are unique in their own ways, they have this in common. They have made Louisiana proud, and they have dedicated much of their lives to serving others. I hope Mrs. Benson is recruiting the next national championship team. <laughs> and I think one thing that wasn't mentioned about her is that uh, after um, COVID, uh, the Gail Benson Community Assistance Fund assisted the hardest hit during COVID the pandemic uh, and has along with her uh, husband, Tom, made over $100 million in charitable donations to the New Orleans organizations. To Mr. Dunn, I congratulate you. And I want you to know we have a con uh, connection that neither one of us knew. Um, my uncle was the lead investigator of the crime against your mother. And he was very proud to solve that murder mystery. And I appreciate all that you've done in the wake of everything you and your family have experienced. Of course, the Pennington Foundation and the family have a close connection uh, to my wife and her family. Uh, Mrs. Pennington, uh, being close to uh, my wife's late father, um, um, him, um, Lord have mercy, I cannot believe I'm doing this, honey. Mundy Lowe, Herman J. Mundy Lowe, uh, as a CPA and a, a mentor to, I think, uh, she and some of her family members. And of course, 
you know, the Pennington family has made such a uh, unique impact. Uh, my daughter is a type 1 diabetic. I am a type 2 diabetic, and diabetes is so prevalent in our community. Um, as we eat so well and so bad in Louisiana, uh, we all need to do much better. Um, I had no idea I would be up here with such a unique journalist um, and accomplished journalist. Um, Mr. Fields, thank you for everything that you have com uh, provided and committed and um, provided to our community, both on a national level and in our state. Um, I, I can't even begin to imagine um, what the Brigadier General has gone through in his career. I certainly understand the complications that we face as a nation uh, just in our elections um, as the Secretary of State and the complications that we face uh, on numerous levels. And I appreciate your service um, for our state and our nation. And uh, you know, whatever you can continue to contribute to us, we would appreciate very much. Each and every one of these individuals we recognize today have used their God-given talents and their blessings to help others. Their work has helped make Louisiana an incredible place that it is today. One day when we are all gone from this world, people will remember our deeds and our actions. No doubt these individuals will be remembered for their kind and generous hearts. Rosa Parks said it best, memories of our lives, our works, and our deeds will continue in others. Sometimes people look at individuals like our Louisiana legends and say, I wish there were more people in the world like them. I hope after tonight, hearing their incredible stories, we will stop wishing for others to be like them and choose to replicate their incredible good works, kind-heartedness, and love for others and ourselves. So on behalf of the governor of the state of Louisiana, and I do not look like the governor, nor do I proclaim to ever be the governor, I issue, I, um, respectfully proclaim this on his behalf. Small print, sorry. <laughs> Real life. Whereas, throughout Louisiana's rich history, we have all been deeply inspired to reach for heights as yet untamed by the courage and fortitude of exceptional individuals whose uninhibited zeal for life and love of challenge have indelibly marked the pages of time. And whereas these Louisianians, through their individual contributions to our people, are varying, are bound by the common balance of compassion, integrity, and the undenying belief in the true strength of Louisiana, her people. And whereas it is fitting and appropriate that we honor Louisiana's legends and express our deep gratitude for all they have done to both further and promote the great state of Louisiana. And to that end, Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting is paying tribute to Gail Benson, Warwick Dunn, Gary Fields, Brigadier General Gary M. Jones, and the Irene W. and C.B. Pennington family. On behalf of Governor John Bell Edwards, Governor of the State of Louisiana, I do hereby proclaim April 27, 2023 as Louisiana Legends Day in the state of Louisiana. Congratulations to each of you. Thank you, Secretary Audouin, for that. We appreciate that. Well, John, it has indeed been a marvelous evening here at Louisiana's old state capitol. It has, and I would just uh, want to say this in wrapping up. 
It's one thing to see these people on stage to present to our audience, both here in the room and statewide and nationwide live tonight, their achievements. But I'm moved by the words that they come up here with. They're not just words of acceptance, and I thank you all, but they're words of encouragement and they're words that we in Louisiana and around this nation need to hear that we can be better and we can do better. And I thank all of you for bringing that message tonight as you accept your award. And now this evening, we want to thank all of you for being here and from all of us at LPB. Thank you for celebrating our 2023 Louisiana Legends. Good night. Support for this program is provided by Roy O. Martin. Based in Alexandria, Wood Products Company Roy O. Martin is proud to fulfill our founder's legacy in supporting the social, educational, and cultural needs of our local communities. Learn more at RoyOMartin.com. The Louisiana Lottery is proud to join LPB in honoring Louisiana legends. Contributing over $4 billion for K-12 public education, the Lottery is giving Louisiana a reason to smile.